thank you again for coming. <laughs> and uh, the question we're dealing with this evening, as advertised, uh, is helping a child feel heard at home. The, the question that was uh, submitted is, we have a 15-year-old daughter who's always talking at home, but complains we never listen to her. Do you have any suggestions? Well, it's not uncommon for a 15-year-old girl to do a lot of talking. If you have a 15-year-old daughter, you can relate to this question. But uh, she doesn't feel that anyone's listening to her, even though she's doing all the talking. Now, we don't know anything more about this particular family. That's all we have is this question. But uh, without having those details of what's going on at home, what may be making this particular girl feel that she's not being listened to at home. I would like to offer a suggestion to this father and to any parent who has a child at home that doesn't feel they're being listened to, and that is to do what's called active listening. Now, what is active listening? It's not my term. It's a term that comes out of the parenting uh, education or uh, consultation, uh, parenting guidance movement. It's been around for maybe 30 or 40 years or even longer than that. Active listening means that instead of simply declaring that you're paying attention or affirming that you're paying attention by saying, I hear you, or uh-huh, or yeah, or wow, or, or I, I understand what you're saying, which is just a declaration, it's just an affirmation that you're listening. In active listening, the listener demonstrates that they're really listening by repeating what's said, reflecting in their own words what they hear the other person saying. This is something that's very helpful between parents and children. It's also very helpful between husbands and wives. As a matter of fact, I've focused my column in the Lakewood Shopper every week uh, recently on this particular subject. If you get the shopper, if you subscribe to it, then uh, you can look at it. It's there every week. It's called 10 Minutes a Day to a Better Marriage, and that focuses on the husband-wife relationship. <clears throat> but right now we're talking about the parent-child relationship. <clears throat> now, how does that work? That means you simply paraphrase or repeat in your own words what you hear the child saying. So you're telling me you're upset that you weren't invited to the party. You're telling me you felt hurt that you weren't included in the club. It, 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 it upset you that, that you weren't allowed to play in the game or, or that you felt the, the teacher treated you unfairly. It doesn't necessarily mean you're agreeing, but you're acknowledging what's being said. And the child feels a, a certain sense of validation. Again, it doesn't mean that you necessarily agree, but you're demonstrating that you're hearing, that you understand what's being said. Now, uh, why is it so important? Well, it's always gratifying to be listened to. You're gratifying me by listening to me right now. It's even more gratifying when someone is listening to you and making you really feel heard. This is something that therapists do very often in a therapy session, and it could be part of the reason why people are willing to spend so much time and money to sit with a therapist week after week, to have that very gratifying sense of being heard. It's not a very um, demanding or difficult technique, and it can be very, very powerful in helping somebody who's troubled or disturbed or upset just to feel heard and to feel that someone's listening. Now. Some people might think, oh, this is too much psychology, right? I mean, after all, uh, if it's really MS, if there's such a thing as active listening, it's important, then it have to be mucker for it in the Torah. After all, doesn't the Mishnah Perke ever say, hafokba, hafokba, v'kulaba? And if there's really something emistic, <coughs> it should be in the Torah. Well, as you can probably guess by now, it is. And I'm grateful to one of my patients who pointed this out to me whose name will obviously remain anonymous for purposes of confidentiality. But if you want to look it up, you can. It's in Choshen Mishpat, Chelek Aleph. Simen Yud Zion, in Hilchus Dayanim. And the Shulchan Aruch says as follows. 
Tzorach Adayim Meshmoya Divrei Abalei Dinim. Pasha Halacha, Adayim, has to listen to the arguments of the litigants. Now, some of you may say, well, I'm not a Adayim. That's for Dayanim. I'm, I'm trying to be a Ventura, perhaps, but it doesn't mean I'm going to be, I'm a Adayim. I don't have smicha to be a Adayim. And yet, we're all Dayanim. After all, doesn't the Mishnah in Pirkei ever say, have they done Skol Adam Lekafskos? So we're all judging, really, one way or another. And when we're listening to people, we're also judging them. And a, a judge has to judge properly. Have a Masunim Badin. It's not only for Dayanim, it's for everyone who has to make a judgment. Now, every time you're listening doesn't mean you're, you're passing judgment on someone, but if it's a very hush of a important communication, like a strong feeling that someone's trying to share with you, then it becomes more critical for you to demonstrate that you're paying attention. And if you're in a din Torah and you're trying to present your argument, that's a very, very important communication and you want to make sure you're feeling heard. And the Dayan has to listen. Not only that, the halacha continues, Ulashanas osam. The Dayan is required to repeat the argument that the litigant is presenting to him. Now, why does he repeat it? So, the Nesiva Samishpat on the bottom of the page says as follows The Shalas Osam, Bifnei Habaldin. The Dayan has to repeat the argument, the Taina of the Baldin, in front of the Baldin. Kodem Shi Yisu before the deliberations of the Din Torah, just after the argument is presented. And to remove any doubt as to what the purpose of this re repetition is, the Nesivas Mishpat says, Kidei shelo yelev ha-baldin nokfin, that the, the mind of the litigant shouldn't be troubled, Lomar, and to think to himself, Ulai lo hevinu ha-dayanim betuv tanasahim. Maybe the Dayan didn't really chop what I was trying to say. He didn't get the message. I tried to tell him what was going on. He didn't really understand. He was listening. His eyes were open. He wasn't sleeping, but he didn't really understand me. But when the Dayan has to repeat it and say over the Taina of the litigant, then the Baal Din feels that he's finally being heard. Now, I wanted to, to bring an example of of active listening. There may be an extreme case, but it does illustrate how this works and how helpful it can be. A number of years ago, a bacher of marriageable age called for an appointment. And when I met with him, I asked him what he was, came for, what I can help him with. He told me that his parents felt he should be starting Shaduchim. After all, he was in his early 20s. All of his friends were starting Shaduchim. And they felt he should be starting also. But he didn't feel ready. And they didn't see any reason why he shouldn't be ready. And they thought, after all, he should be starting like everybody else. And yet he didn't feel that he was ready. And as a kind of a pshara, the parents suggested, you know what? Why don't you meet with a professional and ask his opinion? And if he thinks you're ready, then you're ready. If he doesn't, you're not, you're not. We'll leave it up to the professional to decide. So his parents recommended that he meet with me, and he came to see me. In the course of the initial consultation, and I was asking him why he thought maybe he wasn't ready. Well, what was this Havamina that he thinks he's not ready? In the course of the initial consultation, it came out that unfortunately this Bacher had been victimized when he was younger. And even though it happened many years ago, this was still plaguing him and disturbing him. And he felt, as a result of the consequences of, of this traumatic experience that he went through, that he wasn't ready for Shaduchim. So I asked him if he had ever discussed it with anybody. Does anybody know it about what happened to him? He said he had told his parents not when it happened, but recently, I asked what was their reaction. He said, well, his parents said, look, it's happened so many years ago. You know, you should be over it by now. 
And why should that be affecting you? He said, but he didn't feel that his parents really understood. And the truth was, uh, it was still bothering him. I asked him if he had any therapy or if he had discussed this with anybody else, and he said no. And I suggested that maybe, if he was willing to, that he and I should work together to try to help him overcome the after effects, the, the damage that had been done to him emotionally as a result of this traumatic experience. And he said yes. And I met with him for about another six or eight sessions. He was making tremendous progress. And he was really getting into it, working it through, getting past the, the trauma that had happened when he was younger. And uh, then he mentioned to me that his parents keep asking him, you got to meet with him again? <laughs> yeah, another appointment? You know, how long is this supposed to take? And he felt guilty because he knew his parents were paying for this. And he thought maybe he shouldn't be meeting this long. I explained to him that sometimes these things take a while. And after all, it had, hap it had happened a long time ago, but he hadn't had a chance to work it through, to discuss it with anybody, to, to resolve the, the issues that were troubling him. So he was concerned about his parents kind of pressuring him. He's got to finish up. And he didn't feel he was finished. And he felt he needed more help. He felt it was very useful. And he, he, he could see himself functioning differently as a result of our meetings, but he wasn't done yet. I suggested, why don't we have a meeting together with your parents? The three of us, four of us actually, will sit down together. Your parents will come. And we'll discuss this together. Maybe your parents don't really understand the seriousness of what happened and what we're doing together. I thought that was a great idea, and the parents also agreed, and I met with the parents and the bacher in my office. So the parents wanted to know um, what we were working on, and I said, well, why don't you ask your son? The son said, what happened to him? He had told him about it. And uh, I remember the father turned to him and said, well, but... Uh, You've already had a few sessions already. How, how much longer do you need to go? So uh, the son turned to his father and he said, uh, look, it's, it's, uh, it's not so simple. It's not so easy. And uh, I don't think you realize how much I was affected by this. And then, then he broke down in tears. And Bacher of his early 20s started crying, sobbing uncontrollably. And he was in such pain, not so much from the trauma that he had experienced, but the fact that he didn't feel his parents really understood how difficult this was, how much he was struggling, and how much he needed the help. The father turned to me and he said, is my son suffering PTSD, which stands for post-traumatic stress disorder? And that was a, it's a, a diagnosis of anxiety and depression and stress-related symptoms that are all caused by having gone through some kind of traumatic experience previously in the person's life. And I said to the father, yes, I believe your son does have a form of PTSD, but it's definitely treatable and can definitely work it through and definitely overcome it. So the father said, uh, but, um, but it happened so many years ago, he said to his son. Why can't you just move past it already? And then the son was really upset, and he turned to his father, and he said to him, you just don't understand. You just don't understand how much I was affected by this. When I try to talk about it to you, you always tell me, why can't you move on? It was so many years ago. Why is it still affecting you like this? Can't you just move on and, 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 and get past it? But you don't know what I'm going through, and you never even seem to, to be interested or to care about what I was dealing with. And the son was sobbing uncontrollably. And the father turned to his son and he said, well, 
So what can I do to help now? How, how can I help you now? And the son answered his father, he said, just tell me you understand that this is not something that I can just decide on my own to forget about and move on. Just tell me that you understand that I'm struggling with something very difficult and this is very painful and I'm working very hard. Dr. Wickler is helping me, but it's taking time and I just need more time. The parents would completely mask him to allow him to continue. They thanked me very much for the session. It would, it, they thought it was an eye-opener for them. And they agreed to let the son come as, as long as they felt he needed to. I saw this young man in about another, maybe six or eight sessions, I don't remember exactly. At the end of that second set of six or eight sessions, after we had the family session, the son felt that he had, Bucker had made tremendous progress. He saw in his own functioning the way he was relating to people, the way he was dealing with his chavruses, with his friends, it was totally different than the way it was before. And he felt he didn't need to come anymore. And I said, if you feel that, that we finished our work, then we'll, we'll conclude and we don't have to meet anymore. If you need to meet with me again, you can feel free to, but if you feel that we're, we're finished, then we don't have to continue any further. He thanked me very much. We had a final session at which we kind of reviewed the work we had done together and focused on what was helpful and what wasn't and what was so critical for him about the work that we had done in helping him work through and, and literally get past this trauma in his life. And then we stopped meeting. And about six months later, I got a phone call from his mother. She called me up and she said, uh, Dr. Wickler, I just want to let you know that our son is a chassan. And we are so grateful to you for the work that you did with him. We do not believe he could have gotten to this point in his life if not for the work that he did with you. And we just don't know how to thank you. And we just want to share the, the Basiratova with you. Of course, I was very gratified. I was very grateful and thanked them for calling and wished them Mazel tov. And I think what this case illustrates in a perhaps dramatic way, is how important it is to a child to feel heard. We all need to feel heard whenever we're speaking to anybody, but it's more important if we're talking about something that's very serious or we have strong feelings about. But it becomes even more critical when it's someone trying to talk to someone else who may be of a higher stature, or of a higher status, when it's a child talking to a parent, if it's a Talmud talking to a Rebbe, if, even if it's a, a husband talking to a wife, a wife talking to a husband, in order to make someone feel heard and to have that sense of relief and understanding and that gratification and that consolation it comes from being able to unburden yourself. It's very, very helpful to practice this technique that Chazal mentioned. And I forgot to, to add one thing that, that's in the Shulchan Aruch also. I turn back to that, uh, see if. It's important for a Dayan to repeat the arguments of the litigants and reflect it to them so they're heard. There is a mocker in Torah Shabbat Shabbat. This is the Parsha in Sefer Malachim where Shlomo HaMelech has to judge between the two women that have one baby that's alive and one that's dead. And each one of the women says, the live baby is mine and the dead belongs to her. Now after they present their arguments, 
The Pasuk says, Vayomer HaMelech, and Shlomo HaMelech repeats each one's argument. This woman is saying this, and this woman is saying that. Now the Malbim has a beautiful pshat as to why he did this. If you haven't seen it, you definitely need to look it up. But that's not Nogeya to our Sugya tonight. The Shulchan Aruch is bringing this Pasuk as a raya minatora of the concept of active listening. That Shlomo HaMelech, the Chacham Mayad Mekol Adam, he practiced active listening when people came to bring a case to him. And the example cited is with the, the two women, each claiming that the live baby was theirs. And the Pesach says that he repeated their arguments. It's a very, very effective technique. It's very helpful to do, especially at home, with our B'nai bias, with our children. When children speak to their parents, if the parents can reflect what the child is feeling, and say, you're feeling upset, you're feeling hurt, you're feeling disappointed, you're feeling jealous, and repeat what the child is saying, even if the parent doesn't necessarily have to agree with what the child is saying, sometimes the child is asking for something that the parent is going to have to refuse. We could speak about this, might be a whole other topic. But when a child is asking for something that they want, and the parent says, I know you want this because you feel this way, and you feel it's important, and you feel everyone has it, and that's why you want it. But unfortunately, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you, I can't agree. Even though the parent is not agreeing to what the child wants, but the parent is simply reflecting, repeating what the child is saying, validating the child's feeling, acknowledging, I know you want this very badly. I know all the people in your, all the classmates have it. We're not going to get it for you. We're not getting it, buying it now, but I know you want it and I know why you want it. A child feels heard. And even if they don't get what they want, just feeling heard is a chatsi nechama that can make it much easier for a child to accept the no. So again, the, the takeaway, so to speak, from the Vad tonight is if you want to help your children to feel heard at home, try listening in an active way by reflecting, repeating what you hear them say, and this way can make them feel very much heard at home. I just want to remind everybody, the next Vod will be Sunday, June 19th. It's more than four weeks away, but we have Shavuos coming in between, so it's going to be uh, more than four weeks from tonight. Sunday, June 19th, it will be the Sunday after Shavuos, Bezos Hashem. And if anybody would like to suggest a topic for us to deal with at the Vod, again, I want to repeat the, the um, email address for uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Gross, our able-bodied coordinator to uh, gather the uh, suggestions. It's chinuchvad123 at gmail.com. Did I get that right? Okay. Very good. Bezos Hashem, we'll see you then. Have a Hatzlach Azman. Thank you.